Welcome everyone. I'm going to describe scientific studies of prevention and reversal of heart disease and cancer. The good news is coming that changes in diet and lifestyle could help support health and healing. But first I'm going to show the bad news. How is it that visits to the Golden Arches can result in a trip to the Pearly Gates? One reason might be that the stomach has no teeth. Justify dental bills by chewing and secreting salivary enzymes to aid digestion. Avoid the rotting of poorly chewed chunks in our long digestive tract. After all, what does the little engine that could have to say about eating? Chew, chew, chew. The science is coming. Another reason for visits to the Golden Arches possibly resulting in a trip to the pearly gates is that the conventional diet is an unnatural experiment consisting of carbohydrates from refined foods such as white flour and sugar that shock the body with rapid increase in blood sugar. Complex carbohydrates on the other hand are bound to the unrefined fibers of the plants such as whole grains and root veggies so that after digestion sugars enter the bloodstream more gradually and last longer. By the way, occasionally I may refer to diet for weight loss but mainly diet means the foods that one normally eats. The conventional diet is high in animal based foods but very low in veggies that support long-term health, the green veggies and also the fruits. One of the main vegetables is white potatoes. The conventional diet is an unnatural experiment with processed and low nutrient foods that challenge the body. Here's one possible result of that diet. Plaque is formed of cholesterol, fat and dead white blood cells. It's analogous to a pimple that may pop then clot blocking circulation. Plaque can form in even young adults as has been shown by autopsy studies on accident victims. Let's explore whether surgery is the only option. Atherogenesis involves a high fat level in the blood promoting oxidation of bad low density lipoprotein LDL that penetrates the inner lining of the artery, the endothelium. White blood cells try to destroy LDL but they die in the process. Dead cells, cholesterol and fat form the plaque. Plaque can make arteries stiffer and narrower, restricting the blood and oxygen flow, making the heart ache with painful angina as poisons build up. Cholesterol lowering drugs alone do not relieve the inflammation caused by the dietary and lifestyle contributions to atherogenesis. Fortunately, a coronary team stands by prepared to perform robotic bypass surgery. In reality, cutting edge surgery on a beating heart. The picture on the right shows a coronary artery with a mammary artery inserted to bypass the blocked region of the coronary artery. This surgery was performed on a beating heart by this coronary team. Unfortunately for many patients, the surgical team's preparations are in vain because death is the first symptom of coronary heart disease for more than one in four patients. And death is a serious side effect with a poor prognosis because it's difficult to treat. On the left is normal blood with clear plasma above the cells. On the right is blood drawn after the patient ate a cheeseburger and a milkshake. Floating above the plasma is fat. A high fat level in the blood could increase atherogenesis. Fat also inhibits the release of nitric oxide and vasodilation, meaning the flexibility of the arteries. Increasing risk of a heart attack with stiffer arteries. Logically, these are fundamental reasons to eat a moderate fat diet rather than a high fat diet. This plot shows heart disease deaths as a function of animal fat eaten in many countries, with countries that consume a high amount of fat having higher levels of heart disease. Animal based foods contain cholesterol, plant sourced foods do not. This is a correlation that does not show causation. That's a thought to ponder in the dark of the night. 
It just means that exercise, for example, could be another factor that in some countries reduces the risk of heart disease. However, this population study is worth considering as preliminary evidence of the role of animal fat. Here's another version of that study with low consumption of plant-sourced foods increasing the risk of heart disease in some countries like the U.S., Denmark, and Germany. These correlations are fairly weak evidence because of the possibility of lack of exercise and other factors being the actual cause and not the low consumption of plant-sourced foods. However, such correlations can inspire hypotheses for further research such as the following especially because plant-sourced foods do not contain cholesterol. This shows cholesterol levels in diabetics who experienced a 30% reduction in their cholesterol in only 18 days on a plant-sourced diet with no dietary cholesterol and no refined sugar. How remarkable a reduction in cholesterol and strong evidence that eating more plant-sourced foods can reduce one of the risk factors for heart disease, one of the critical components of plaque. The plant fibers help eliminate excess cholesterol. While the body needs cholesterol, the liver makes enough, so we don't need to add more by eating animal-based foods. When we eat less of them, we may well lower risk of heart disease as well as cholesterol level. An MD by the name of Dean Ornish conducted a study on 45 patients, not using any cholesterol-lowering drugs and prescribing a plant source diet with zero dietary cholesterol, although the patient's livers were still making cholesterol. The patients ate low saturated fat because saturated fat is low in most plant sourced foods. 80% of the patients experienced reopening of their coronary arteries after one year. There was a beneficial side effect. The patients lost an average of 22 pounds. Another MD by the name of Esselstyn conducted a study of 18 patients prescribing a plant sourced diet. This was a very small study, but it lasted for 20 years. Most of the patients had been told that they had a very short time to live and were inoperable. They were desperate. Therefore, Dr. Esselstyn allowed them to continue taking cholesterol-lowering drugs during this study. The 18 patients had suffered over 45 coronary events prior to the study, but suffered only 5 coronary events during the 20 years. The plant source foods were probably the main cause of the major success with this study because the patient's improvements in coronary health occurred after the improvement in diet. One of his patients came to Dr. Esselstyn complaining about angina pain in the leg artery and a pulse volume test was performed. That occurred before the patient had started the protocol of the plant source diet. After only 10 months eating those foods, the pulse volume had expanded to normal levels. The patient was free of pain within that relatively short time. In other words, the body reabsorbed the plaque and recovered with a supportive diet instead of the conventional diet continuing to challenge the body. Another of Dr. Esselstyn's patients had a coronary angiogram taken at the beginning of the study showing restriction in that coronary artery. After an extended period of eating plant-sourced foods, that patient's artery reopened. Beef may not be the only animal-based food that's problematic. In all likelihood, milk products are also troublesome. After all, calves grow over 600 pounds within a year helped by milk and the growth factor that's even in organic milk without any additional chemicals added. Because that growth factor is identical to the growth factor in people that can cause cancer cells to grow and reproduce, the American Cancer Society says to emphasize plant-sourced foods. Instead of National Prime Rib Day, which might as well be National Heart Bypass Day, how about National Lentils, Rice, Kale, and Walnuts Day? I want to emphasize legumes because they're high in both protein and complex carbohydrates. So legumes can form the foundation for many meals, providing support and sustenance for hours. 
almost no restaurants soaks legumes before they serve them. So most people think that they can't digest legumes without problems. However, try soaking lentils for 8 hours or larger beans for 24 hours, then rinse them before boiling them. The biopesticides that the seeds use for protection from insects leach into the soak water, making the legumes more digestible. Also, taking digestive enzymes helps break apart molecules that otherwise might cause gas. Lentils are a good legume to try because they're the gentlest to digest. That's why I say National Lentils, Rice, Kale, and Walnuts Day. Unfortunately, high homocysteine levels worsen inflammation that can lead to damage of the lining of the blood vessels, increasing the risk of atherogenesis, heart disease, and stroke. Homocysteine is an amino acid that's produced by breaking down another amino acid, methionine. Homocysteine can be converted back into harmless methionine by the body with sufficient folic acid, B6, and B12. Folic acid and B6 are abundant in unrefined plant-sourced food. One can supplement critical B12, then if one still has high levels of homocysteine, take homocysteine support formula, which has all three, plus trimethylglycine, another molecule that helps to reduce homocysteine levels. That support formula is available by special order at Green Star of Ithaca. During this serious talk about health, I can't tell any jokes about sex, especially jokes about that delicate subject of impotence, impotence that could be worsened by atherosclerosis that hardens the arteries, atherosclerosis probably caused by eating excessive animal-based foods that are supposed to make men virile. It's painful to realize that men in their 40s or even younger may suffer so much from atherosclerosis that it limits the blood supply needed for potency. The economy would suffer if word got out that veggies work better than Viagra. Clearly, when it comes to sex jokes, I've got to just say no. How come all this isn't better known? Let's follow the money backing better living through chemistry and processed food. Pharmaceutical companies can afford hundreds of millions of dollars for large clinical trials with people. For lettuce, only less expensive lab tests and population studies have been done. But the cumulative evidence for plant-sourced foods does form a basis for wise decision-making. The conventional diet is the experiment after all, not the traditional diets. So how about rejecting that conventional experiment by adopting a guideline of mainly eating a wide variety of unrefined plant-sourced foods? I'm sharing this information not to blame the victim, rather to empower the patient. Can cancer be addressed in a supportive manner by changing food and lifestyle in a way that's complementary, in addition to whatever conventional medical treatments one's decided upon? Beyond the slides that I'll show about cancer, the website has free resources on many health issues that can be downloaded as a public service, including a series of seven useful and congenial audio interviews with leading a nutritionist T. Colin Campbell. Also free is my ebook Healthspan. The website is climatehealth.org. Cancer gets initiated in a cell when DNA gets damaged. Of the trillions of cells in our bodies, some become cancerous almost every day. The body usually destroys them. However, when our diet promotes cancer cell growth and reproduction, that promotion can overwhelm the body's ability to destroy the cancer so that clusters of cancerous cells form. During progression, the cancer spreads. Animal-based foods can play a role in promotion. Let's see why. The next few slides were donated by Professor T. Colin Campbell. 
This one shows the growth of precancer clusters dependent on the percentage of calories eaten in casein, which is a milk protein. At the beginning of this study, the lab rats were dosed with aflatoxin, a carcinogen that initiates cancer. For percentages of casein less than about 8%, the precancer clusters did not grow. For percentages over about 8%, they grew. So this is evidence that eating excessive animal protein can promote cancer. In the United States, many people eat over 20% of their diet in animal protein. And it can be seen that for 20%, the rats experience substantial growth in those precancer clusters. Considering the epidemic of cancer in people, the unnatural experiment of the conventional diet is probably one of the causes of that tragic onslaught of disease. The precancer clusters are shown again as a function of time after aflatoxin dosage with 20% casein milk protein causing a growth of those clusters, but few clusters growing with 5% casein. Clusters are shown over a 12-week period with the amount of milk protein given to the rats lowered from 20% to 5%, then increased to 20% again, and down to 5% again. It can be seen that the cancer clusters grew with 20%, then got reabsorbed with 5%. This evidence shows that the body can destroy early stage cancer if it's not promoted by diet. If the body is not challenged too much, it can send the immune system to destroy the cells. Also, the cancer cells sometimes undergo apoptosis or cell death if they themselves sense that something is wrong. When the milk protein was increased again to 20%, the cancer cells grew and reproduced so rapidly that those mechanisms of the body for reducing and reabsorbing cancer were overwhelmed by the rapidity with which the milk protein promoted the cancer. So cancer was turned on, then turned off, and turned on again then turned off again in the same rats. This is extremely strong evidence that excessive milk protein can promote cancer. And milk protein stands in here as a proxy for any animal protein. Again after aflatoxin dosage for the animals that received 5% in casein, all animals were living and active at 100 weeks, the end of the study. For those animals that received 20% in milk protein, all were dead at 100 weeks from the aggressive fatal cancer. More strong evidence in support of the theory that the body can defeat cancer unless excessive animal-based protein promotes the cancer until it becomes an aggressive fatal cancer. How about plant protein? Wheat protein was tested in this way, but not shown to promote cancer. And probably soy is safe, but the studies of soy phytoestrogen are controversial, so it might be safest to eat on a maximum of 25 grams of soy protein a day. It's easy to get plenty of protein without soy by eating other legumes, grains, and unrefined plant sourced foods. I mentioned earlier that no large trial has been conducted for lettuce. But how about for broccoli? Not for a billion dollar pharmaceutical that could bankrupt us while hurting us with side effects. A study of broccoli. Indeed, this was a large study involving aflatoxin, the carcinogen produced by a species of yeast in corn, rice, soy, and peanuts, particularly prevalent in a province of China. An MD named Paul Talalay went to China with the hypothesis that the molecule sulforaphane in broccoli speeds up the elimination of toxins from the body. He conducted a gold standard large placebo controlled double blind study with daily administration of broccoli sprout extract. 
The amount of aflatoxin remaining in the body after taking the extract was significantly less for those patients receiving the extract than for the placebo patients who did not receive the extract. Sulforaphane spurred bodily reduction of aflatoxin, showing that the broccoli can play a role in the prevention of initiation of cancer by carcinogens such as aflatoxin by stimulating the body to destroy the carcinogen. That researcher used an extract, but pretty clearly, if one eats a considerable amount of vegetables, especially broccoli, as an unrefined food, and chews it thoroughly in order to break apart the cells to release the good phytonutrients, one would benefit in other ways than taking an extract, because the whole foods contain many phytonutrients that are not present in an extract. So eating the unrefined vegetables would be supportive of health. These are the activity levels of sulforaphane in frozen, fresh, and three-day sprouts of broccoli with the sprouts winning. They can be found in some health food stores, but even the frozen and fresh broccoli contain significant amounts of beneficial sulforaphane as well as other good phytonutrients. Here's a study of breast cancer as a function of total fat intake in many countries, with people consuming more fat getting higher levels of breast cancer. Fat may be a proxy here for the conventional diet. Some people speculate that Asians have genes that are more robust and resistant to cancer. But that's not necessarily the case. It may be that their diet is more supportive of health, not as extremely imbalanced with refined and animal sourced foods as our conventional diet. For people who migrate from Asia to the U.S., the rate of breast cancer that they experience increases from the low level that people in Asia get to the high rate that people in the U.S. get, possibly because the migrants often begin eating the conventional diet in the U.S., providing more evidence against the conventional diet and evidence that genes are not primary. Here's an even stronger study about genes. Harvard MD Dean Ornish actually measured the expression of a gene, that is, whether it was turned on or off. The researchers conducted a study in people suffering from prostate cancer who had been eating a conventional diet. After only three months of plant source foods and exercise, a prostate cancer promoting gene was turned off. A protective tumor fighting gene was turned on providing remarkable evidence that gene expression is the key, not one's inherited set of genes, and evidence that challenges such as a conventional diet may cause gene expression to worsen and promote cancer, while a supportive diet can cause gene expression to change in a supportive way. This study revealed the fundamental biochemical link between diet, disease, and health. This shows incidence of colon cancer dependent on meat consumption in 23 countries, with the U.S. experiencing high rates. The study concerned meat, so it's evidence that not only casein milk protein, but all animal protein is implicated. In another population study, rates of breast cancer were correlated with milk consumption. In addition, there have been similar results for uterine cancer. Deaths by prostate cancer are shown dependent upon the supply of non-fat milk, that is skim milk, which is mainly protein, with countries that consume a lot of skim milk getting higher rates of prostate cancer. But life just isn't fair. In fact, it's absurdly unfair with death by skim milk. Unfortunately, it has high levels of animal protein, which in excess has been shown to promote cancer. This plot shows estrogen levels over a month, from menses to ovulation to menses, with a high-fat diet causing high levels of estrogen and also causing a more severe crash from those high estrogen levels shortly before ovulation and also before menses. These severe swings could be a reason for cravings for comfort food during a crash. With a lower-fat diet, the estrogen levels are lower with a less severe swing making it easier to resist comfort foods. 
These schematics show estrogen levels throughout a person's lifetime, with average levels in the U.S. substantially higher than levels in rural China, possibly because of the higher fat diet in the U.S. Also, menarche occurs at an earlier age in the U.S. than in China, probably one reason for the high teen pregnancy rate in the U.S. The total lifetime estrogen exposure is the concentration times the duration. That's the area under the curve. That total exposure is substantially greater in the U.S. where menopause occurs later than in China. Excessive estrogen is known to promote cancer, another reason for the high rates of cancer in the United States. I should mention that adipose fat tissue makes estrogen increasing exposure. It's worth emphasizing that the American Cancer Society has published documents endorsing more consumption of plant-sourced foods. We've covered most of this information, so I'll continue on. This graph shows a tight correlation between the incidence of type 1 diabetes in children through age 14 and the milk consumed, with countries that are greater consumers of milk products having higher rates of type 1 diabetes. Finland is at the top of this list. The U.S. is in the middle and Japan is lowest. That's an interesting population study, but correlation doesn't show causation. So how about more detailed research about the biology of diabetes? Antibodies are synthesized by the immune system to tag molecules that the body wants to get rid of. Cells destroy those molecules. Researchers discovered an antibody in people to a peptide of milk protein that's a chain of amino acids, the building blocks of protein. It's a long enough chain so that normally the digestive tract would not let the chain into the blood supply because it's too large in that chain form. Instead, it would get broken up first into groups of two or three amino acids. So one would think that the chain wouldn't have anything to do with diabetes, but the results of this study show that in normal children, there are very low levels of this antibody to the milk peptide chain. And in type 1 diabetic children, there are higher levels of antibodies to the milk peptide chain. The hypothesis is that the peptide transfers into the bloodstream during illness. The reason is that with gastrointestinal inflammation, the intestines can become leaky and let larger molecules into the blood. This milk peptide and other peptides of animal proteins, including those from flesh, could slip into the blood and cause autoimmune disease, in this case diabetes. Perhaps also it could cause lupus and other autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. This research provides strong evidence that animal protein can initiate autoimmune disorders. Once people have diabetes, it's essential to limit swings in blood sugar. Insulin is the hormone that helps sugar move from the blood into the cells. On the conventional diet, many diabetics need to inject insulin to prevent blood sugar from getting too high. This is a study of insulin usage in diabetics who experience dramatic reductions in those levels over just 21 days on a plant source diet. Type 1 patients were able to use less insulin by changing their diet so it was not challenging the body. Type 2 patients could possibly get off insulin entirely with a continuation of a mostly plant source diet, which helps the body become more sensitive to insulin meaning that insulin is better able to unlock the key that allows glucose to enter the cells than previously when that lock was blocked in the surface membrane of the cells. So the research shows that cells become more sensitive to insulin on a moderate to low fat, mainly plant source diet. This benefit means that one has to issue a disclaimer that diabetics need to take care when changing their diet because if the insulin level is maintained at the same rate after dietary improvement, a diabetic could become hypoglycemic with low blood sugar as the cells become more sensitive to the insulin. That's not to say that diabetics should avoid making improvements to diet only that diabetics need to monitor blood sugar levels and insulin dosage closely when making improvements. 
This plot shows hip fractures correlated with dietary animal protein. Those countries where people consumed high levels of animal protein experienced high rates of hip fractures. The reason for that correlation could be that animal protein in general contains more sulfur than plant protein. The body metabolizes animal protein to the sulfate ion, which is almost identical to sulfuric acid. Most of the body must be alkaline to survive. Only the stomach needs to be acidic. However, milk protein, for example, metabolizes into sulfuric acid, which weakens the bones because the body has to buffer that acid load by drawing alkaline calcium phosphate from the bones to maintain the body in an alkaline condition. The World Health Organization has called the resulting weakening of the bones the calcium paradox because the calcium content of milk is outweighed by the impact of the acid-forming protein. This graph shows bone loss in elderly women who unfortunately experienced a greater rate of bone loss with high consumption of animal protein as compared to the women who were consuming a low level of animal protein. So strong evidence has been gathered that animal protein, including milk, can worsen osteoporosis. In fact, calcium is not beneficial. One's better off getting plant-sourced calcium from legumes and green vegetables. However, that's going against the Dairy Council's $200 million in annual advertising and paid research supporting milk as a beneficial product. The research contradicting the industry's mantra has only come out in the last decade showing that milk is not so helpful after infancy, that nature has very good reasons for weaning animals off of milk. No other species has experimented with drinking the milk from different species. Objective scientists are finding that this unnatural experiment is counterproductive. Therefore, it's best to stay off milk once weaned from mother in infancy. Of course, one needs exercise to maintain bone strength, and it might be easier to start by taking five-minute strolls frequently throughout the day. The same is possible with free weights for the upper body. By the way, when you lift free weights overhead, it's a little bit risky for the back. It's safer to sit while lifting weights overhead with your back more supported so that you can gain strength without pain. We've chewed our way through the main course of the presentation, so how about dessert? Let's not have cheese for dessert, though, because the FDA has to allow one drop of pus per glass of milk from all the cows with painful mastitis. Pus that drips into the milk that is mixed with the milk from the rest of the herd. The reason I'm showing this difficult slide is that natural addictive casomorphins are in all milk. Casomorphine. Casomorphins are nature's way of motivating babies to drink more milk. These addictive casomorphins naturally in milk make it harder to wean infants. But once a person has been weaned, casomorphins only cause addiction to milk products from dairy. So to beat that addiction, consider mastitis and the pus in the cheese. The pus gets concentrated 10 to 1 from the milk to the cheese. Please remember that nature has many good reasons for weaning animals off of milk. With all due respect to dairy farmers who have to be savvy business people to make a profit in that competitive business, milk products are the first of the animal-based foods to give up for reasons of health. An MD by the name of Neil Barnard has been very prolific writing books that are useful for these subjects. He publishes from a website called PCRM.org. It's well worth checking out. You can buy books such as Breaking the Food Seduction or Foods That Fight Pain. One of the points made in that book is that ginger can help reduce pain as well as eliminating refined sugar. Other books are The Program for Reversing Diabetes 
and eating right for cancer survival. Dr. Barnard has written a very useful library of health supporting books. How is it that the same diet of unrefined plant sourced foods supports prevention or healing from many disorders? The conventional diet so challenges the body that improvements in the diet such as we've been talking about can support the body for dealing with many different disorders ranging from cancers to infectious disorders because the immune system and bodily repair can be supported by a mainly plant sourced diet. How pure does the diet have to be? While the ideal diet is plant sourced and unrefined to get all the nutrients, perfectionism is stressful. It really depends on one's family medical history. If one has a very strong history and one is not suffering from any disorders, then there's more flexibility. But if one has a family history of cancer and heart disease, it would be worth taking precautions and trying a healing diet of entirely unrefined plant sourced foods with only condiment sized portions of animal based foods, if any. Here's a practical protocol taken from my free ebook called Healthspan from the Dietary Support Appendix. Taking vitamin B12 is crucial when eating mainly plant sourced foods as well as frequently consuming greens and colorful vegetables, root vegetables, fruits, legumes, walnuts, olives, or avocados, and whole grains. I mention colorful vegetables because those have more phytonutrients for supporting health, as well as antioxidants as do some fruits like blueberries. Walnuts have relatively high levels of omega-3 fatty acids, a beneficial fatty acid. During the winter time, and if we don't get out in the sun, we may need to support vitamin D. Also, supplementing trace minerals could be important if absorption is an issue. In the book Healthspan, I wrote about conditionally essential supplements in the chapter by that name. Those supplements may be necessary as we age, so that's a chapter worth looking at. If one occasionally suffers from prolonged depression, it may be useful to supplement B-complex and DHA which support the nervous system. DHA is a long chain omega-3 fatty acid, not the hormone DHEA. Whether or not one is eating entirely plant sourced foods, these guidelines are useful for long term robust health. How is it that fad diets go wrong? Here's an example. A low fat diet modified from an animal based diet actually has more animal protein in it than a high fat diet because people drink the skim milk instead of the whole milk. And the skim milk has a higher level of protein in it. I'm not saying that one should drink skim milk. This chart shows that the diets have been misused and misapplied over the last few decades. Cholesterol levels are actually higher in the low fat diets because of greater consumption of animal based foods. It's important to realize that the fad diets that try to continue a high level of such foods can result in increased risk of the degenerative disorders heart disease, cancer and the others as well. The protocol described in the last slide can be used to lose or maintain weight while supporting health and healing. Furthermore, the American Institute for Cancer Research has found that no amount of processed flesh can be considered safe. And that's no baloney. The reason is that there are multiple carcinogens in processed flesh, including chemicals used as preservatives. After all, what's in guts and in sausage? How about avoiding the skin of intestinal epithelium and the scraps of byproducts from animal processing and trying 100% veggie alternatives? The veggie alternatives are high in protein and delicious flavors, packaged in sausage links as well as luncheon slices. There are beneficial side effects from changing to a mainly unrefined plant sourced diet. I was raised on a small family dairy farm eating bacon, eggs, milk, steak and a lot of ice cream. When I switched to a plant sourced diet my weight plummeted and my cholesterol plummeted as well. In fact eating plant sourced foods 
I feel like I've discovered the fountain of extended middle age. Junk food is defined as nutrient poor refined food. That includes olive oil and all other oil at 120 calories per tablespoon. Because oils don't contain the beneficial phytonutrients and fibers found in the whole foods. Also, the oils put one at risk of a heart attack because they reduce the flexibility of the arteries. So how about skipping oil-based sauces and using water-based sauces plus olives or walnuts? Those unrefined foods contain more nutrients and greater bulk to fill you up faster, making it easier to lose or maintain weight. The unrefined foods on the left contain the same amount of calories as the foods on the right, but they're much bulkier and much more nutritious. This food pyramid is by the MD Joel Furman, who recommends that people eat the foods that are highest in nutrients per calorie. The highest nutrient density foods, such as green vegetables, beans, and other legumes, and fresh fruits and whole grains. In his food pyramid, he puts animal-based foods at the top, meaning less consumption, and plant source foods at the bottom for the vast majority of the diet. He also has written an excellent book called Eat to Live that's available from his website, drfurman.com. Dr. Dennis Burkett traveled the world researching the diets of various peoples. He coined the infamous saying that large hospitals get built on small hard stools. After all, in a low fiber conventional diet, constipation is ubiquitous. Many people who eat that diet with very little plant sourced fiber experience constipation. That means that the bolus is in the intestinal tract longer, allowing toxic bacteria to rot in the digested flesh and form carcinogens that might initiate colon cancer. With increased formation of poisons in the intestines, the level of gastroenteritis is higher among those eating the conventional diet. Eating that diet while supporting hospitals with their small, hard stools. So how about eating unrefined plant-sourced foods? There are a wide variety of them that support health. Are there any other reasons to eat these foods? The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization has issued a report called Livestock's Long Shadow that livestock farming creates more heat-trapping gases than transportation because ruminants such as cows and goats eructate. Now that's not a dirty word. In fact, it means that they belch. Methane, which has over 21 times as much global warming potential as carbon dioxide. In addition, the fertilizer that is used to feed the plants that livestock eat is broken down by bacteria into nitrous oxide, which has over 310 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. That's how livestock farming creates more heat-trapping gases than transportation. By minimizing animal-based foods, one can save almost as much warming as driving a hybrid car. If hundreds of peoples changed diet, that change could save the climate. I give presentations on climate change impacts on agriculture and how to reduce emissions society-wide. The slides and video, as well as an article about money-saving tips for energy efficiency, are on my website, climatehealth.org. Here's one tip. Have an energy audit performed in the house using a contractor who has an infrared scanner that detects cool spots. That scan can reveal places where insulation is uneven or missing, and also where the attic floor actually leaks, so that the scan can save hundreds of dollars over a year. Here's a virtual handout about an article with many such tips on how to save money through energy efficiency. It's called Climate Change, the Urgency of Emission Reduction, and How to Reduce Emissions of Heat Trapping Gases. It's available for free download from my website, climatehealth.org. A chapter by the name Toxic Nibbles is in my book, Healthspan. Here are a few of its points. 
Animals are at the high end of the food chain, so environmental poisons get concentrated in animals' fats as they eat plants with a lower concentration. For example, animal-based foods are denser in poisonous PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, which are everywhere in the environment, denser than plant source foods with lower levels of PCBs. Another tip is that lead dust may surround houses that have been sanded. That dust may be in the dirt and the garden, dust that young children might eat when they're playing. It would be worthwhile testing the lead content of the soil around the house, especially in the garden. Beyond lactose intolerance, milk is one of the most allergenic foods. An example is that milk could trigger migraines. A few words about HMOs. They have the mistaken perception that promoting prevention doesn't pay. Even though the substantial savings probably could be achieved within half a year of patients improving diet, plus productivity gains could be made in workplaces. However, the HMO's perception is that client turnover rate is so high that investments for education for long-term prevention don't get repaid before the client leaves for another HMO. Truly, the system's broken when nobody is rewarded for promoting prevention. So how about universal health care? Does it stifle innovation? Not in France. They invented deep brain stimulation therapy for Parkinson's, a treatment that gets used in this country. What about over-treatment of the insured? The majority of health professionals do care. The Consumer Reports produced a study that showed that more fees get collected from patients who have insurance as more service gets provided. Therefore, there's pressure to overpromote to those insured patients less necessary and possibly harmful tests and treatments. Consumers Reports listed the 10 most overused treatments, including back surgery for slip discs, heartburn surgery on the sphincter, cesarean sections, coronary stents, mammographies resulting in occasional needless biopsies and increased risks because of exposure to x-rays and CT scans. There are risks with any treatment, including with over-treatment. Like skim milk, some of the more commonplace and mundane foods can also be carcinogenic. It's just not fair that the pepperoni on pizza could initiate cancer, while the cheese promotes cancer, and the refined flour feeds cancer. Any one of those foods is to be avoided for optimal long-term health, but for pepperoni pizza, it's three strikes and out. Remember, these days, really excellent tasting veggie versions of many of our favorite foods are available and worth a try. The difficult information in this talk may cause stress, which I learned to relieve as a child by eating, so I got overweight. After losing 50 pounds, one of the keys to maintaining my weight has been release of stress by other means, such as relaxation methods, refocusing stress instead of comforting it, substituting the comfort of the pool of calm for comfort food. Free audio is available at climatehealth.org for an eight-minute session of progressive all-body muscular tension, relaxation, and specified breathing, one of the most satisfying and practical methods of relaxation that I've come across in three decades of practice. What is the difference between hard and soft stools? Fibers from unrefined plant-sourced foods. Does all brand cereal fit within the guidelines that I've been talking about? No, because those fibers in all brand have been refined, so they're lacking the phytonutrients from unrefined plant sourced foods. And the sharp edges from those hard fibers may not soften enough while traversing our long digestive tract so that they end up irritating it and worsening gastroenteritis, inflammation of the intestine. It may be that hospitals will get smaller as stools get larger. The world can be sustained by mainly unrefined plant-sourced foods. I'm always seeking further venues for donating my presentations, so please let me know if you hear of any. I can also give the presentation by internet using a high-resolution camera plugged into my laptop. 
The transcript of the questions and answers after the presentation is available from my website, climatehealth.org. A PDF and the original PowerPoint slides and the transcript of this entire presentation are also available free.